We definitely need to talk about this. Central banks around the world have been dropping liquidity in recent weeks as markets continue to barely grind higher. So what's going on and what's happened in history? Today we'll be talking about that along with the hottest markets not being so hot anymore and the new opportunities for all of us on the horizon. Also, are you looking at volume in the wrong way? Today we talk about how you could improve this on your charts. Stocks, commodities and cryptos coming up in the special weekend edition of the Markets Around the World. Well, welcome back, everybody, to The Daily Show. My name's Tom, and today we're discussing the macro, the lead indicators, and the hottest charts that are going to help you become a better investor and trader. Let's go through everything that's been happening in the markets, though, straight away. Goldman Sachs are giving four scenarios between 6000 and 4500 by the year of the end. That's not going to help us, Goldman, but let's have a look at the data and the stats that may help us find better solutions. Here's the month of April. Here are the stats on what happens each day, and you can see there's more blue than red in general. But what might surprise you is the rotation that continues to usually happen around this period. And as we've been discussing now for the last one month, the opportunity actually hasn't necessarily been in the hottest markets by what retail traders think. Everyone's going for semiconductors, but we've been talking about gold, metals, energy, and utilities in recent weeks, and they have been absolutely flying. Congratulations to anyone that's been in these, because look at the last five days, you would have never thought utilities would be number three, but it has been. And this may continue actually for a couple of weeks for that particular one. But where it gets more exciting is gold, metals, and the energy sector. Yes, the last one month of rotation has been significant, and semiconductors got beaten out to only be 6.15% after experiencing one of those massive moves that we saw from NVIDIA. As we kind of thought about it, SMCI, NVIDIA, and many, many others are starting to go into a consolidation pattern. So what's going to happen during the month of April, and more importantly, next couple of weeks? Well, we've got some warning signs, and we've also got some good news. So let's break it down on how it can help us as traders and investors. Firstly, Goldman Sachs believes the market, by one of their major metrics, is 10 to 20% overvalued. Now, they have tended to be pretty good on this indicator. So since the 1990s, this has suggested that we are in about a 2 to maybe 4% return over the next six months. Now, because valuations remain incredibly overly extended based on historical models, in fact, 18 of 19 of them are flashing red, which means that they're overpriced, we know that we're just looking at price and following that the most. And that will be the most important factor, as we already saw it in March, really stop what is usually a seasonal sell-off. In fact, sitting presidents running tends to lead to the markets actually dropping off during the March period. Was that what happened? Absolutely not. The market continued to grind higher in a dull state where it made a series of higher highs and higher lows, not breaking under the key daily 20 moving average, which we'll look at at our analysis and why you need to be following that. But let's have a look at the next quarter. This is the important period. Are we tracking that may look like that? Well, the most two correlated markets right now are 2012 and 1976. And in both cases, we ripped during the start of the year and then went into sideways to down markets during the next quarter. Now, we have earnings season coming up very soon, so just make sure to sub to the channel because we'll be following along that earnings season. There's so many amazing opportunities coming up, I'm sure of it, that that will be a big deal. But what about April? Well, did you know that the stats for April over the last decade are 90% in favor of the bulls, both April and May being very, very positive? What I'm tending to think here and what I think we're all seeing is rotation together. We're actually seeing commodities become very, very hot, energy breaking out potentially if it's weekly, which we'll watch later on, and some of the hottest markets becoming overcrowded. Now, do you know which particular sector moves down during the month of April? If you do, put it in the comments down below and pause it right here, but it is actually semiconductors. Only 30% of the time are semiconductors up during the month of April, and specifically the last couple of years, are very negative for this period. Now, if you know and you've been following the markets, NVIDIA is the most popular stock right now, SMCI, Micron, every single AI stock or anything to do with semiconductors has been ripping. But over the last month, it hasn't been the best performer. And we saw that there was that big blow-off that happened during NVIDIA, considering that we've been going in a huge sideways market, which has been okay for day traders, but not necessarily the best for somebody that's looking at those massive options moves happening straight away. 
The one thing is here is that we are getting a pullback in time currently on those charts, and it's perfectly normal and could suggest that Wall Street is actually moving into other great asset classes. And we've already been following a lot of those together, but take a look at this, the Magnificent Five, all over saturated from the funds. Now, if they start to move to the downside on those and CTAs could be showing us that, then we need to also think about constant valuation changes. And because semiconductors make up such a big part of the market right now, if they start to drop off or go sideways, it's very possible the market may creep downwards or even just kind of very slightly grind up as we see these rotations out. So could the Russell 2000 growth be the best area for us? Well, something suggests maybe the weekly close in particular is a huge deal, which we'll look at later on. What an opportunity. But also the percentage of non-earners has improved. In 2021, most of the Russell wasn't even making money. 45% of the stocks were actually losing money. That's come back down to a more considerate 30 to 35%, which is still bad, but overall it is improving. And it brings us to this chart. So rotation, are we getting it? Well, there's a few things that say maybe we are. This year, some of the major returners have been gold and commodities. And if you want to see this chart in a little bit more detail, it's over on our X account. So make sure to follow down below if you're interested. I'm thinking we might be returning back into a period of the mid 2000s. And that's not from the index not doing so well, but it could be that commodities are coming out. You'll notice gold's up there this time around. And also the Middle East countries and many other countries around the world are recognizing that it's incredibly important during this green and AI revolution that's going on in the world to invest in rare earth minerals. Those have been doing some of the best this year. Gasoline, of course, absolutely flying 39% up, gold improving, silver improving, and then copper and aluminum or aluminium, which has been moving pretty strongly over the last couple of months. So does this make sense? Well, in a non-recessionary environment, which is what currently we're suggesting that the markets are in, we typically see these things breaking out. Agriculture stocks have been breaking the last two weeks. All of these stocks have been breaking out and we've been following that money. So while most people are probably looking at it from a perspective of, oh, semiconductors are the best, there's a lot of other opportunities in this market. Speaking of the market, let's break down the S&P 500 for the coming week before we get into some more data and then some hot opportunities. Let's go through the S&P 500 from an RSI perspective. We put this in one of our previous videos and I thought it was just interesting because we are at a very elevated RSI. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, that means we need to sell the market straight away. It doesn't necessarily suggest that. We've actually gone into huge rip rallies uh, afterwards or pullbacks in time. They've generally been the two things. So the rip rallies end bad and the pullbacks in time end up in rotation. And that's what actually could be going on. And of course, from a monthly closure, we have a very strong monthly close. Always watch your monthlies, look at your weeklies. These become very important. We run a day trading masterclass. It links if you're interested. And basically in that, I talk about how positioning is everything. How does Wall Street position? How do the biggest funds position? How do you read volume? All of these types of things become important. So the S&P 500 is closing near its highs. That's a good deal. It means the bulls are in control. The big one that you want to be watching if you're new to the channel is going to also be the daily 20 moving average. A series of higher highs and higher lows have continued to make this particular indicator pretty key. And if we get a break below that, the bears could finally be starting to get into control. So who was in control during the session? Well, it was pretty much an even kind of trade. But one thing happened where we pushed higher near the close and then sold back off. Now, notice that we closed around the 5250 level. And that's going to make a lot of sense when we take a look at options. And options are controlling this market at the moment due to us being in what we call a positive gamma environment. Basically, the markets are completely driven by these particular options. Now that we've got the rise of the zero DTEs, the OPEX matters a little bit less. And what's happened is markets are driving based on what's being opened, what needs to be hedged. We can see here that during Monday of this week and Tuesday, we have two major levels, 5260 and 5275. If the markets break above 5260, they're probably going to move towards 5275. If they get below, above this, 5300 becomes the next logical kind of level. On the downside, we've got 5220 and 5200. And if we break through the 5246, that could bring the bears back in, at least for now. Breaking through this lower level of 5200, though, will expose some pretty serious zones. 5175 
and possibly the even deeper pullback, which gets us all the way into corrective territory around that 50-90 zone and break below there. Well, yeah, the bears are in control at that point. So will we be looking closely at the charts? As always, we will. And there are some warning signs from the central bank liquidity, which we'll look at in just a moment. Let's go through the ODTEs, though, in terms of what they look like. So why are we saying 5260 could be a bit of a resistance? Notice the strikes here that are currently open on the Monday trade session. If we manage to break through those, this is a resistance. So obviously, there could be price that sells off that area. If it does manage to break through that, it may need to be hedged into the next major strike, which is 5275 in the next session. You'll notice on the majors, we've got 5300 and 5400 now starting to get quite crowded. And for now, we remain in a positive gamma environment. If this ever changes, though, we'll alert you first. So make sure to subscribe because this is going to be a huge deal for the bears or for any kind of corrective move. Following what's going on in these options day to day is becoming increasingly important. And of course, we do it here. So let's take a look at the sentiment indicators and how they've updated throughout the week. The Bank of America one first, 5.8 in the middle. It's actually dropped three points. So that's showing kind of bullish signs. The general retail sentiment out there, the bears are gone, 22.4% and 50% bulls. Now, this can sometimes be a contrarian indicator, although in these big bull rallies similar to 2020, it's one of those times where we can't pay as much attention to it. It was elevated back then for quite some time, and it's shown to be elevated right now. Will we see volatility in April? Well, Goldman Sachs believes so, and I tend to think so as well. The VIX has remained below that kind of 15 read for quite some time. And actually, this means that there is a decent chance the markets will get a little bit crazy over the next couple of months. In fact, Goldman believes the market's only pricing in 5 to 6% chance, whereas they believe it's a 25% chance of over a 5% move on the S&P 500, whether that's up or down. From an iVol spread, no wonder we're not seeing any volatility. Look at these things. Absolutely one of the lowest reads I've ever seen, if not the lowest during my trading career that goes back into the mid-2000s, and that's some wild stuff. So it shows you that nobody believes that there is any sell-off coming anytime soon. And right now, the price action again is supportive of that. So where do we put our money? Where do we flow into if semiconductors aren't any good? Well, of course, things like the RSP looks pretty good. The value models that we've looked at in recent videos, go back and check our last one if you're interested. And it could be just in general, the Russell growth and commodities. Yes, they're all undervalued based on the historical medians. And it looks like the market's starting to pick these up as we get a little bit rich on the AI valuations. So let's take a look at what most people are talking about right now, which is the percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average. In fact, it remains around 80% during this time. Do we get a sell-off straight away? Well, not really. In fact, it's usually quite a few days before we see corrective moves, and it tends to be the ones that come out of the overall sales that are the hottest in, term, in these runs. And of course, you could argue that we went into a bit of a recession during 2022 from a stock market perspective. Now, these are the big reads in terms of seeing a bullish run. Advanced decline lines are improving. Cyclical versus defensives are improving. Consumer discretionary versus staples, something we like to see, is improving, showing the American consumer strong. And bonds are also holding with the market for now, though they will be one we want to be looking at. But when we take a look at the NASDAQ, this is the fifth longest streak above its 200-day moving average so far. We've just gone into this level, and you will notice that sometimes the NASDAQ can start to struggle around these periods. These are just the reads that we've had, and a lot of them are sideways. So what it's suggesting is that we might be going into a period where markets are showing a little bit of rotational signs. Again, something we've been following so far. NASDAQ Composite is, again, when it's one year above its one-year moving average. If we take a look here at the stats themselves in terms of what happens next, there are quite a lot of reds in some of these readings. And although the overall positivity is good, if you actually look at the next two months and even three months, there are some periods of time where we have negative markets or at least less than the overall bullish stats that tend to go in there. I notice a lot of toppings in this point as well, where we go sideways, sideways, top off, top off, etc. So these are all great reads for us to come into when we're thinking about central bank liquidity. 
Some of my favorite sectors so far remain to be gold, specifically gold stocks. You can see here as gold versus the S&P 500 ratio. It's one of the worst on records, a beautiful support. It's been sitting there for quite time, some time and gold stocks have been doing really, really poor. When we go into a Q1 that's really good, like it's just been Q1 greater than 10%, what's in line next? Well, Q2 actually has the worst stats with it, again, pointing to that sideways style market being the most realistic and a lot of rotation underneath, as only 72.7% of the time was it positive, in comparison to the full year, which was 100% of the time. So should we remain bullish on stocks? Yes. May we get a better price, possibly in some of the hottest sectors, and we might be getting some really good entries on the other ones. It really does look like a rotationary market. S&P 500 quarterly performance, when we've had these 10% gains, this is how it looks on a chart so you guys can see it. And if you want to, pause the video there and take a look. Are we due a correction? Yeah, absolutely. We're well over 100 days now from the last correction or a period. We generally average around 67. And I tend to think, again, it's going to come in this quarter if it's going to happen based on what we've seen in the past. Where are we in the bull cycle? Well, probably about three quarters of the way through it. And you'll notice here, these are the correlations with the other periods. Now, we bring this chart up because I think it's an excellent representation of this sideways market tending to be in all other scenarios. Here's the most closely correlated, 50s and 80s, and then also the correlation here between 74 and 42. In all circumstances, there was either a pullback around this time or a sidewaysing pullback in time. And this is really, again, with those stats, and it makes a lot of sense in these markets right now. For this week ahead, this is the information you'll want to be paying attention to, specifically the non-farm payrolls. This is the one the Fed will be paying the most attention to overall. Will we see unemployment spike up? Your, good, your guess is as good as mine in the hot economy we're in right now. But one thing is that this provides opportunities to often see new changes in trend and also sometimes get really, really good entry points on these markets. From the CTA perspective, they are still absolutely maximum long. Here's an update for the S&P 500. That little dip instantly birches back up. So they are super long right now, the systematic traders. We've also got the NASDAQ ones weaker across the board, and we'll be updating if these drop off. Remember, if we get under there and we make a new lower low, I think it's go time in terms of a corrective move on markets. Let's now jump into what happened with the core PCE. So yeah, it rose up. Yes, it was a little bit higher. I think we were looking at January's initial reading going to a 0.45% gain and core PCE was 0.26 during February. So was it a little bit higher? Yes. Is it in line with probably what the Fed has been talking about? I'd say so. And we remain looking at this information, but really just following price more than trying to interpret it. Here's where I think things get really interesting. We've talked recently about liquidity and markets, and this tends to be a very early indication of sometimes some weakness in markets, specifically for the one that's breaking out right now, the Russell 2000. So central bank liquidity, both the Fed central bank liquidity, how we track it here, and the overall world central banks are both dropping what looks to be supportive markets. And if we take a look at the that versus the S&P 500, you can see here, that when we have these big drop-offs, it can be early. Here's the drop. The markets went sideways at this point. Here's the drop that came in over in this period. The markets rallied a bit, but then they dropped considerably, which is one we followed last year. And then from that point period of time, we've been very synced with this, with this market and everything going on. Now, because we're going into earnings season very, very soon, this also makes me think that maybe if semiconductors continue to weaken, that we could be going into a pullback in time or even a little corrective drop. We will need to be paying a lot of attention to these central bank indicators. And this is a function of so many different metrics. And we'll look at some of those metrics in upcoming videos. So make sure to stay tuned for that. What about the VIX? Well, the VIX is really low. So this is one that you'll want to watch as well. Set your alerts for 15 to 16. We already know the VIX has been heavily short sold. So that basically means that Wall Street is massively shorting on it. And if the VIX does break out of 15, 16, we could be going into everyone's favorite short squeeze. And a short squeeze would bring, of course, the bears. So it's pretty low right now. I always say watch reactions off the 12 level. That's a big zone for the VIX, but it's not above the 15 to 16. So no warning signs there. 
High yield junk bonds and our junk bond and our junk bond reading in general is both in coiling fashion. And if this breaks to the upside, that's a positive thing for bullish market momentum. And if it ends up breaking to the downside and it, the markets are going up during that period, I would be, yeah, hedging the market. Let's just say that. <laughs> I would certainly be hedging it. This is another read we have to do with high yield junk bond options. And at this point, we did get a little bit of a higher high here last week. If that continues to pick up, and markets start to go sideways or even turn down, central bank liquidity goes down, and we get another read or two. If the price action then drops, wow, yeah, it's probably on, and it's going to be a significant or at least a decent correction, 5 to 10% in move. US two-year in the middle of nowhere, so that hasn't really moved outside of the ranges we should be setting alerts for, and the dollar index had a pretty good close to the week. Now, it does kind of suggest that pullbacks are going to be met by bull demand here on the dollar though not my favorite trade. I would have liked to have seen a more convincing close at like 104.40. And if that had happened, yeah, strong things were on the horizon for it. US oil is doing really, really well, breaking back up to 83. Super strong trade here last week. Mark out your highs, 83.86, 83.83.6. And that level is going to possibly push into the 88s. So it could be really on for oil Really nice weekly closure. And for anyone that got this one as a trade and uh, you had the metal to hold it through, uh, through especially this level here, that is a fantastic level. So fantastic work. Gold also been super bullish on this recently. It's been moving higher and higher and higher. It just got through a new all-time high here. I think it's going to 2300. Let's see if it can get there. And really our long-term expectations on gold continue to be quite bullish overall. From the perspective of volume as well, I just want to kind of talk about volume and why most people sometimes read it incorrectly. Here's the volume on gold. And while this is not the same as stock stock volume, which I like to use even more, you'll notice there's two red bars. Now, everyone assumes that means that everything is sell pressure. And it isn't sell pressure. It, necess- it just means a huge amount of transactions going on. And ultimately, the candle was closed to the downside. Now, where I think you need to look at volume a little bit more cautiously is when volume is massive and you hit key levels. Now, we talk a lot about key levels on these charts and we discussed specifically 2172 and this low here, which is the price of around 2155. Now, that was actually a key level for us, the 2155 zone and 2172 gave us the confirmation. So we're using multiple techniques to have the patience to react to markets. As this was also another fantastic trade, which we do teach in our day trading masterclass. When we break down overall what happened here during the week, you can see that the market came into this level, which is that 2155 zone, and it found some buyers. Now, the volume remained elevated through both of those candles. So if we go back to the daily and just have a look, the volume remained very, very strong through both this candle and this candle. Now, this one we can clearly see was indecision, a high and a low and an open and a close, what we call a long leg doji. Then we have the next candle, which ends up being kind of bearish in sight, but notice the way it reacted off this 2155. I often say wicks hold orders. And what this is telling us is that while the volume was elevated, someone tried to purchase this up off this level. The wick injected up and it was quite strong in terms of the bounce off the key level. When you're seeing wicks on key levels with massive volume and then that goes on to confirm whatever your particular systematic approach is, that's very strong. So remember in the future, when you're looking at volume, even if it looks red, don't just assume it's all sellers. There's buyers there as well. For every seller, there's a buyer. And what you're looking for more is wicks on key levels. This is a huge deal and it really changed the way that I perceived markets. I hope that helped. And if you enjoy this type of segment, make sure to let us know in the comments down below. Let's move over to the next one now, which is silver. Everyone's favorite underdog. It's like the Ethereum to Bitcoin and often it goes wild when it does break out. We remain still looking at that 2586, but I can tell you one thing, silver didn't do too badly when it came to closing. Notice it closed above all these wicks. Again, wicks being the discussion point here. That's a fairly big deal on the daily. And the weekly also held up overall. So it does look like someone's trying to scale into 
the overall silver position. We know that it's going to go most likely ballistic if it goes through 2582, which could bring in the 2780 zone. These are all key levels that we'll be watching and silver definitely coming on the charts again uh, because it's starting to heat up. What about gold stocks? Really nice move. Almost hitting into our secondary TP zones. This was an excellent, excellent trade. And for people that have been following gold stocks in particular, they've been doing better than semis. You know, look at this. From the bottom here, this bottom, by the way, in February, they're up 22.76%. That's like semiconductor earnings, uh, but not without having to take those types of risks. Is there more in it? I tend to think there is, but we are at that resistance point. So we'll need to break through a kind of 32.50 plus. And if we manage to get through that zone, 35.50 is the next level. I'm excited. I'm hoping gold continues to improve this year. Semiconductors versus the SPY. Keep this combo on. Notice the daily 20 moving average just barely holding that up. It's held most of the others. And even when we went below, we ended up going green, which is another lesson for a day in terms of uh, where we're doing the education on these TA stuff. Now, this was a very key read. We got this read back in March when NVIDIA got absolutely hit. And it shows us again, rotation is going on in these markets. When we have a look at the other opportunities, we've got mid cap funds doing really well, new highs for mid cap funds. This is just one of them, which is Don, which tends to do well over these periods of time. And energy had a great weekly close, which again shows you that energy stocks are looking to be bought up when they're coming back. So rotation happening everywhere in this market. It was the same for XME, super strong weekly close and daily close, suggesting that markets are trying to rally all these commodities. And this is really where the flow is going at this point. Utilities also improving, although I will caution on utilities. It tends to run maybe for another week to week and a half. This has been an incredible run, great run for utility stocks in particular. But yeah, I don't really like utilities past that point. Maybe it outperforms. <laughs> it usually is a very late cycle kind of position, uh, which I don't think we're at that quite yet. What about AAPL? The one strongest stock in the market is the... It's pretty sick. It's back at supports. We've seen some buying pressure, but we saw a sell off that most traded previous accumulation zone. And that suggests that no one really likes this while the DOJ is investigating and everything to do with the world's kind of major governments are getting into antitrust and all those other types of things. So you'll notice here volumes have remained elevated. If we do break out of the most accumulated zone, that's going to be an alert you want to have on your charts. And if we break to the downside, that could also be some type of trigger to the downside and double topping action. Now, that may be a trigger as well to show you that big tech is starting to move out of the market. So AAPL worth watching. I tend to think that a dollar cost averager might like it at these prices, but there are some warning signs that quite a few fundamentals traders are looking at. Series of higher highs and higher lows for the Hang Seng. So that's really important to be looking for. And we're looking at a break here of 17,200 being the key key that gives us 18,000. And I'm liking a 17K break in general, giving us the momentum. The downward trend line as well would be broken through, which would be really nice. So China still improving across the board. Aussie 200, another one to be following towards the bullish side. Same with the UK 100, the FTSE. Both very strong closures, both massively commodities, financials, and rare earth minerals. So why are they breaking out? Well, because everyone's trying to short them in particular. I'll post over on X the updated short levels, but I bet you there's tons of retail traders trying to short these ones. I wouldn't be short in the UK 100, I can say that. It's broken through that ascending channel. It's doing really well, and we've talked about it a few times now. Just like the Aussie market, they're both improving and pullbacks are looking to be bought up. What about the queues? Well, the monthly close sucked. It was a high, it was a low, it was an open and close. What is it? It's a long leg doji. What does that mean? It means the markets are at equilibrium or they're at basically a level that they think it's okay. So again, it points into that idea of a pullback in time or at least some kind of weird sidewaysing market. All the stats, all the data are suggesting exactly what we're seeing in front of our eyes, which I think is sweet because that makes more sense when you see those types of things. And the market also pushed to a new high last week, which on the queues could point towards some type of distribution. Remember, we could have a BC, a UT, and a UTAD by Wyckoff's concepts. We're too early to tell yet, but it is just grinding up. I don't like shorting dull markets, and that's, that is really dull. So certainly something I wouldn't be trying to have a go at too much, but we are watching it. 
Russell 2000 time. Yes, the breakout was real. This thing was sweet. So we actually ended up getting a really nice breakout on the weekly. I don't like the daily on Thursday. That kind of sucked. But the weekly still held up. And it suggests that rotation is coming in for this particular market. Now, I like to use the futures. So let's have a look at the futures market and look at the key levels. But you'll notice here that we've got a 2250 potential target, pullbacks to be met by bull demand. And I do have a stop sign here, which usually means it's a little bit extended, uh, but that's not going to stop me from looking for pullbacks into buys. And as we've been following on this channel, the day trades have been actually in the Russell, specifically last week when we broke through this level, an excellent buy zone. We alerted you guys first for that so you could see it. And for now, it's grinding higher. So as long as it remains in a series of higher highs and higher lows, things are good. If the markets start to look worse than that, hey, we'll pay attention to it. But Russell 2000 looking much better. What about Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, it's doing okay. It's not doing the best. So had an excellent trade off the 62,000 level and 63,000 level. It's now consolidating and we've got wicks up and down all around. So that's showing us it could be distribution or accumulation because the trend's up. We're going to go with its accumulation. That is the more statistical chance. And you're looking for breakouts of the 72K zone. Once that happens, you're looking for new highs. And that's kind of what is being suggested by the markets at this point. Can accumulation, potentially new highs coming. Downward could press in the bear, but really I don't think I'd even be partially bearish on the Bitcoin market until we get under 60K. That's going to be that level where you're looking at a 15% drop like that. And that, that will be cool because I'm, I'm sure a lot of Bitcoin traders would love to get the price in there. But yeah, until we go under this level, you've got to be a bull on Bitcoin, don't you? Let's have a look for the week ahead. There is a bit of information. Some bank holidays will mean that Monday is a little bit lower in terms of overall trade volume. You can see here the major events. And the big one is really going to be the jobs numbers. That's the non-farm payrolls. I expect the dollar index, so that's the US dollar, to move quite a lot over here. I expect the markets to remain possibly in the middle of nowhere land, especially on Thursday this week. But I think rotation is going to be the key. If you enjoyed today's video, then make sure to subscribe. Smash that like button, guys. Thank you so much for watching. It's been an awesome week. I hope you did well in the commodity switches. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.